We have now covered from ancient times through about the early 1950s the ideas and notions that shaped the general public or society as a whole, their view on homosexuality. It is completely normalized in some cultures, such as ancient Greece, but socially unacceptable in other societies at other times. Moving forward, we'll be discussing the events that unfolded from the late 1950s through now, events for the most part that would begin to normalize society's view of homosexuality. But to start this new section, I want to point out first that with the medical model explaining so much of human behaviors these days, that today there's a great discussion over whether it's nature or nurture, whether genetic or learned, whether destiny or choice. For every study that determines that there are internal factors such as genetic or physiological differences, another study then refutes those theories. I might present to you the idea that sexual orientation is the result of a complex interplay of predetermined characteristics, meaning genetic, which are also then influenced by environmental conditions, meaning the learned. And that really takes me back to one of the central themes of this course, that neither biological nor sociological explanations, neither by themselves, can adequately explain human sexual behavior. So moving forward with this unit, let's now discuss the more recent historical and political events and issues. We'll start first with McCarthyism in the 1950s and how that then created the stage for change in the 1960s. It's hard to believe that homosexuality presented any kind of a credible threat to the national security in the 1950s. But it was Senator McCarthy who issued in this period of McCarthyism that created concerns about the national security and thought that the military personnel that had been discharged from the milita military service for being homosexuals presented a threat to the national security. Senator McCarthy fostered the belief that homosexuals had infiltrated the military and that their presence created a national security risk. So homosexuals were viewed as outcasts, and the thought followed that they should not be employees of the federal government since they shouldn't be in the military either. The rationale that supported the belief that homosexuals compromised the national security was that there were concerns that they could be subjected to blackmail. The idea was that if someone discovered you were homosexual, then you could be blackmailed by being outed. And in order to prevent being outed, that you then might compromise national security interests. So that rationale was used by the CIA and the FBI to discriminate in employment all the way through until the mid-1990s. As far as the military is concerned, during the 1940s, the number of individuals that were discharged for homosexuality averaged about 1,000 per year. Ten years later, by the 1950s, that had doubled to 2,000 per year, and by the 1960s, it had risen to 3,000 per year. With the national government discriminating openly against gays, that gave the state governments free reign to harass private citizens. So the police routinely would arrest men that were in bars. Now the effects of harassment had some very interesting unintended consequences. It was very likely that there was an arrest section of the local paper and anybody who was arrested and booked, their names would be printed in there along with the charges. And what the police would generally do would they would sweep a bar and arrest everybody that was in there. By publishing the names of all the individuals that were being harassed and arrested, that made the public aware that this type of behavior was much more common than they had previously thought. The other interesting unintended consequence was that by publicly posting those names and the places where those people were meeting, it made it easier for other people who were part of that community but didn't know the folks that had been arrested it made it easier for them to make those connections. So it created more of a social network, an awareness that there were other people out there that were like them and who those people were. And it also broke the general silence that surrounded gay activity. So in the 1950s, a group of men got together and developed an organization that they called the Mattachine Society. The men that met with this group felt oppressed. 
They felt that they had a common experience that they studied by talking about their own lives and sharing their experiences. They talked about their experiences in gay bars, and they also shared their feelings of loneliness that they had experienced before coming out and before finding a support group where they could talk about their experiences. So by developing this society, a group consciousness began to form. They became aware of their own oppression. And this is a central theory that was developed by Marx, that in order to start a social movement, there has to be some sort of consciousness about what the group is experiencing for them to be able to develop common dialogue. So in order to encourage the growth of the group, the founders decided to sponsor semi-public discussion groups. So the group decided that their objectives would be to unify, to educate, to help members see that they were part of an oppressed minority, and to lead for the struggle in emancipation. About the same time, another group for lesbians was being formed, the Daughters of Belitis. That was formed in 1955, and they modeled the structure of their group after the Mattachine Society, but this was a group for women. The greatest issue that many of these women struggled with was that in order to maintain a lesbian relationship, at least one of the women in the couple had to be a breadwinner. And at that period in time, it wasn't as acceptable for women to be out in the workplace, so some women actually had to front themselves as men, present themselves as men, in order just to maintain their relationship with their partner. Both of these groups had publications, and the great advantage that having publications created was that it developed a sense of community, it allowed for discussion among group members, it created a common vocabulary so they could talk about their experiences using this vocabulary. The Mattachine Society created a publication called One, and that was started in 1953. The federal government, under the Comstock Law, seized it when it was put in the mail. The Postmaster General seized it and refused to mail it on the basis that it contained obscene, lewd, lascivious, and filthy materials. The Postmaster General's decision was challenged in 1955. It went up to the United States Supreme Court, and they reversed the decision, but they didn't publish the case, so it wasn't something that was of public knowledge. It was just sort of swept under the rug. So both of these groups, the majority of group activities revolved around discussions that focused on the self-identity. Most major cities had chapters that published a newsletter, so that allowed individuals to network and meet each other that way as well and the national leadership for the Mattachine Society was in San Francisco. During the 1960s, there are additional changes that have a huge impact on the public's acceptance of sexuality. There are huge changes in the pornography laws, and so now by the 1960s, it's legal to possess pornography, whereas prior to the 1960s, in many states, it was illegal to possess it just on the basis that it was lewd and lascivious material. It was obscene. The United States mail started allowing, acknowledging that people could use the mail service for materials that had sexual content. In addition to that, censorship was reined in by the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court issued the famous Miller decision, which allowed individuals to possess pornography. Lesbian pulp fiction became very popular, and also pop journalism started paying attention to the homosexual lifestyle and publishing articles about it. The 1960s also saw the rise of popular sociology. Sociology was used to explain all sorts of social problems. Previously, homosexuality had only been discussed in psychological literature, and now sociological pieces are starting to pay attention to it. Two seminal theorists that were also very popular, they were published under the genre of pop sociology. Howard Becker in 1963 wrote The Outsider, and Irving Goffman in 1963 wrote Stigma. And both of these drew on gay experiences to illustrate their theories. These weren't the only types of deviant behaviors that Becker and Goffman depicted, but it was one of the types of behaviors. And these were very popular books with the general population. So there are changes in views during this period of time. 
Writers start to drop their scientific neutrality when they're writing about social problems, and instead, they become the promoters of social reform. So journalism was promoting the idea that laws created the problem, not people or the behavior itself. And by 1963, questions about whether the sodomy laws should be repealed start to emerge. And so remember, sodomy isn't just talking about homosexual activity. Sodomy is also talking about any kind of unnatural sex. So in the early 1960s, every state had a law in its book that said that mouth genital contact was illegal. In the 1950s, the ACLU was not concerned with the gay movement. The ACLU, and that's the American Civil Liberties Union, they were much more concerned with other types of civil liberties, such as First Amendment freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of religion, issues revolving around race. However, in May 1963, there was a patron of a great gay bar and restaurant who was arrested, and when he went down to the police station, the police, without any provocation, assaulted him, and he was beaten and hospitalized. And so the ACLU took that case, and that was a turning point where the ACLU decided it was going to go ahead and back the gay movement. So at this time, San Francisco and the beat starts to emerge as a place where alternative lifestyles and the arts proliferated. And so it became a place where gays and lesbians could go to, and instead of being considered an outsider, they were considered a part of the community. It was a community that welcomed people who were part of an alternative lifestyle. And that's why San Francisco starts to emerge as what was known then as the National Gay Center. The problem was it created a political backlash against the bars. And so the mayor of San Francisco had an unofficial policy that he wanted the police to go out and sweep the bars and arrest all these patrons. Because of all the harassment, the ministry in San Francisco became very sympathetic and the ministers met with the gays and lesbians to discuss the issues that they were experiencing. Part of what the ministers wanted to do was create a relief fund for some of the people that were severely oppressed. The ministers got the permit to do the dance, and they also got an unofficial agreement by the mayor of San Francisco that they would not be harassed, but they were. And the police came to the street dance and arrested three lawyers and a woman ticket taker that was there. So the result of that was that the gay community organized a hotline to provide lawyers, photographers, and other assistants whenever the police came and harassed them. So then they were able to publish instances and make the public more aware of what was occurring at the gay bars, and that actually resulted in the halting of that harassment in San Francisco. So when the harassment halted, the number of gay bars grew from 20 in 1963 to 57 in 1968. Just a few years later, there was the Stonewall Inn incident in New York City. And that was a gay bar in Greenwich Village where the police went to make a raid and sweep the bar and arrest everybody. And they had crammed all of the patrons in the paddy wagon but for one last very drunk woman. And she was able to pull herself away from the police officers as they were shoving her in the police van and ran back into the bar. The police grabbed her, pushed her back in again, and she ran back into the bar again. And so they drug her out one more time, and by then, she's kicking and screaming and fighting and cursing at them, yelling at the top of her lungs. And a group of onlookers had gathered. And the group of onlookers, in protest to what the police were doing, started throwing bottles and garbage cans and anything they could grab at the police, which resulted in a full-blown riot that lasted two days. The National Guard had to be called in, and this riot made national news. So now this is the first time that an incident revolving around the harassment of gays and gay bars has made national news. One year later, there was a commemorative march from Greenwich Village to Central Park, and the gay movement had gained a national following. 